Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely to have you with us this evening for a, what I hope will be a contemplative program of Bach's music. As you'll see in your program, it's uh, built around eight of the preludes and fugues from the well-tempered clavier, but also interspersed with some music by a great Hungarian composer, Yogi Kurtag. We have a small number of his original pieces punctuating the program, but most of the program, as you can see, f uh, moves back and forwards between preludes and fugues and Kurtag's arrangements for duo of some of Bach's organ music. And so part of the idea of the, the program was to contrast this music that was not just written for a different instrument, but for quite a different context, a church context versus a more uh, domestic setting. As you'll see, there's a long list of pieces we're going to play. You'll be relieved that many of them are short. <laughs> we would like to play them through in an unbroken progression, so we would ask that you withhold applause until the end. Thank you. We will um, try and structure them, though, into four parts, so we all know where we are. <coughs> Each part has a, a Kortag miniature, one or two chorale preludes, and two preludes and fugues. <clears throat> now, one of the striking things about these preludes and fugues of Bach, the 48, is how strikingly differently he characterizes the preludes in each particular key. And like many 18th century musicians, he believed that individual keys had very particular qualities, characteristics. Partly this had to do with the tuning systems of the day. Um, what we would like to do is just share with you, between each of the uh, four parts, just some reflections on what these keys meant to some of these 18th century musicians. In particular, we'll be just quoting from one of Bach's great German contemporaries, uh, Johann Matheson, excuse me, <laughs> Matheson, who um, gave, I think, some very beautiful poetic descriptions of these keys. So just before we play the first row, I might just ask Sonia to read the Matheson's description of G minor. So here's what he says. G minor, almost the most beautiful key, because it not only combines the rather serious quality of the previous key with spirited loveliness, but also brings in an uncommon grace and kindness. Therefore, it is fitting for tender as well as for refreshing things, for longing as well as for happy ones. In short, it is suitable and thoroughly flexible to both moderate plaintiveness and tempered cheerfulness. And this, this contrasts so strikingly with Matheson's description of the next key, E minor, which he says can hardly be considered joyful no matter what one does with it, because it is normally very pensive, profound, grieved, and sad, though in such a way that there is still hope for consolation. Something quick might well set in, but this does not mean that the key becomes at once joyful. So we'll get to E minor a little later, but we start this evening in the wonderfully radiant key of E flat major. Thank you.
Juan, very appropriately on the Kyrie, which is the first moment, as you probably know, of a mass. Uh, we're moving on to the second part that introduces the more unusual key, perhaps the most unusual in this set, um, F sharp major and F sharp minor. We think of them now as very sort of common keys, but back when Bach was writing, those keys were very rarely used and for very special uh, pieces. So here's what Madison says about F sharp major. He says, F sharp major, although it leads to great, no, sorry, this is, I'm reading minor. F sharp major is a splendid mixture of a noble and because of the infrequent use of the key, a strangely lofty pride, fit to put the listener in admiring awe. And I'll let Stephen read about F sharp minor. And also, we've got two very contrasting chorales in this session as well. F sharp minor, on the other hand, although it leads to great distress, nevertheless is more languid and lovesick than lethal. <laughs> Moreover, it has something abandoned, singular and misanthropic about it. The first chorale prelude in this set is also in F sharp minor. So I think that description applies beautifully to that one as well.
is framed by two rather comical pieces by Kurtag. The first of them is just uses one note, F, in different registers of the keyboard. And so it leads nicely into our next prelude and fugue, which is also in F major. Matheson writes of F major, he said, it's capable of expressing the most beautiful sentiments in the world. Whether these be generosity, steadfastness, love, or whatever else stands high in the list of virtues. All this it does in such a natural way and with such incomparable facility that nothing has to be forced. On the other hand, F minor appears to be mild and calm, yet at the same time deep and heavy with despair. It represents a fatal anxiety and is exceedingly moving. It expresses beautifully a black, helpless melancholy and sometimes causes the listener to shudder with horror.
last part contains Kurtag's own homage to Johann Sebastian Bach and two very gorgeous uh, chorale preludes, rather dark ones, but the preludes and fugues are glorious in two wonderful keys. The first is E major. Now, Matheson was a contemporary of Bach's. Um, he didn't speak for Bach. And just in this case, I'm not sure Matheson really reflects Bach's music, but I wanted to read to you his description of E major. He says, it expresses a desperate and wholly fatal madness incomparably well. It is most suited to the extremes of helpless and hopeless love, and under certain circumstances is so biting, severing, sorrowful and penetrating that it can be compared with nothing but the fatal separation of body and soul. Perhaps you'll hear that. <laughs> I must say I'm struggling. The definition below strikes me as more suitable, but you can make up your own mind. Well, on a much more light-hearted note, the G major is described by Madison as possessing much that is insinuating and persuasive. Moreover, it is quite brilliant and is suited to serious and to cheerful things. And I think that's quite a fitting description as you will hear.
Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. I'm going to step into the limelight a little because part of this 48 ways of looking at Bach when we conceived this was to have a little chat with the performers at the end of each performance to find out why their 48 ways are different from any others 48 ways. You're most, most welcome to stay. 10 minutes, no more. We like to keep it brief here, but I hope you'll enjoy a chat. Please welcome back to the stage, Sonia and Stephen. <laughs> I should introduce myself to my name is Marshall McGuire. I'm the Director of Artistic Planning here at the Melbourne Recital Centre. I'm a Bach lover. I'm in awe of people who can play the Bach preludes and fugues like you can. So thank you both. You, you created a most beautiful game of doubles tonight, a little choreographed switching off the stool. Are there two? There are two. No, it's a big duet stool there. One question I have to ask is how do you decide who plays the top and who plays the bottom? Well, it was sort of um, dictated by the logistics of the structure of our program. Yeah, we, maybe Stephen wants to explain, we had the whole key scheme happening where all the keys related to each other and the keys smoothly, you know, the chorales led into the preludes and fugues. And we wanted to create a very smooth, seamless, sort of circular movement throughout the concert, almost like a, a ritual of sort, you know, and perhaps like a metaphor for infinity, which Bach, I think, represents to all of us and so it basically fell to that who ended up <laughs> being the, the right next place person at the right time. Yes, exactly. it's interesting with this, this exploration those of you who are here for the first part of book one where Paul Grabowski played the first preludes and things he did them in reverse order he played where you started with E minus so he must have finished with whatever it was mm -hmm. but he finished with the C major prelude how did you go about choosing which order they went in because one way to do it would be just chronological in key, step by step. Well, uh, yes, that, that was an option we considered. Um, as soon as we decided that we wanted it to be one overall sort of structure, it seemed good to start and end in the same key. So we started with the G minor and finished with the G major, and then play, uh, chose chorale preludes that were close to G minor, and that led us into E minor. So it was the, the chorale preludes <coughs> are in variety of keys, and we just sort of had to select which ones would lead us nicely back to G by the end. And beautifully led it was too. I have to <laughs> say, this middle bunch of keys in this first book, the G minor for me is one of the darkest, mm. saddest keys. Um, F sharp minor just and F sharp major just don't make any sense to me at all. <laughs> in Bach's time, of course, and we know from Matheson, as we heard this beautifully descriptive um, words about the keys, the misanthropic F sharp minor, it's wonderful. <laughs> Is it hard, did you find it hard as performers to capture this sense of the affect of these emotions? And the next part of that question is how are audiences meant to make something of this where you know, we perhaps don't have that emotional connection to keys, or maybe we still do? Mm. Well, I mean, I guess, um you know, now that our ears are so used to atonality and contemporary music where, you know, something like F sharp major or F sharp minor is a very ordinary thing to our ears, but I think sort of 250 years ago, it must have been a very jarring kind of sound, you know, and I think having those descriptions uh, and reading them out framed, uh, framed this prelude and fugues nicely to give people some sort of a reference, you know, an appreciation for, for that um, kind of emotional fervor that people felt about those keys. And, um, and I think also framing them with Kurtak also created the juxtaposition that sort of intensified the, the character of each, uh, each of the keys. And Kurtak certainly a very playful, crystalline, delicate composer. The works you chose, that waltz and in on one note, <laughs> astonishing, <laughs> and flowers become me just almost nothing. Stephen, I wanted to ask you as well. With um, the points has gone straight out of my head now. It was a very good point. Oh, one of the other things, <laughs> along with keys, is that Bach doesn't write any tempo markings for any of these preludes and fugues. The the notes are just written. Does the key affect the way you play? Does it affect the tempo you choose? Do you play it slower if it's darker, or how does that work? Well, I mean, I, I suppose Bach left so much open for the interpreter to bring to the music, and that's one of the glories of it, I suppose. So he doesn't give tempo indications. Most of the time he's not even giving articulations, where he certainly would have expected the person to do that. So it's, it's lovely for a performer to be given that carte blanche, as it were, but 
what do you decide to do? So th this is partly why I love those, those affect descriptions, because firstly it reminds us that Bach, though he's a consummate architect, that actually at the front of that structure is something that still is supposed to engage with our emotions. So I, I find this really, really very helpful as a performer to read those sorts of descriptions and remind myself that it's not about just playing evenly and accurately, that actually you've got to convey something beyond the notes. And as I say, that he leaves infinite possibilities for individuals to find is why we keep coming back to this music. And I imagine this is why Kurtag, one of a composer we don't hear enough of, I think, in his country, is, has had this exploration of the Bach chorale. This is his way to get a little bit deeper into the music. And of course, he wrote these. This is very much music designed for this occasion, this sort of salon music, isn't it? He played the beautiful YouTube exactly. clips of Kurtag playing with his wife, yes. this old couple sitting down playing piano duets. Very old fashioned, but very profound in its mm. connection and its intensity. Yeah. Um, uh, Yes, 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 and, and Kotak was 90 last year, so this, this very touching image of this, 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 who was also a fine composer, also a magnificent teacher, and so this showing us these lessons, this maturity that he has is one of the really beautiful things. It just shows mm. that Bach truly is timeless. I imagine you've both been playing Bach from an early age. Yes? Oh, yes. Good. <laughs> and uh, as, as I have, I've always been scared of the fugues, and <laughs> as part of this journey, I've found that my attention is drawn quite clearly to the fugues as the heart of these works. This is where the, these gnarly, sort of almost atonal mm. themes come out, and yet um, there's this, as you say, clarity with Bach and this intensity, but this emotion underpinning it all. The other thing I love about these fugues is, and the preludes as well as even the minor keys all finish in a major on a major chord and this dates back to the early baroque too with monteverdi and this convention of even if you're a minor key the final cadence is always major it's something else to look at and marvel at the works of this great composer our next concert in this series is on thursday night anna goldsworthy is in the room she's moving us forward or back a little bit depending which way you look at it matching the works of bach with mozart and chopin and beethoven and comparing and contrasting Keys. We've got a month of Bach. We've got a concert on the 24th of June, the Passions of the Soul, where we have harpsichord music, cantatas, trio sonatas, the whole bit, concertos. And we also have our fabulous Bach competition, um, which we've been running for seven years now, where students under the age of 17 get to come and play Bach. So it's a, it's a right through from early ages right through to Kurtag. Stephen, Sonia, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. thank you for coming. Good night.